Welcome to the Red Door Church Sermon Podcast. Red Door Church is a church seeking to transform the city of Pretoria by the power of the gospel. We are distinctly mission-minded, community-cultivating, and city-loving. Please enjoy this week's sermon, and don't forget to follow and continue the conversation by sharing with those around you. For me to share in the word today. Um, yeah, thank you, Maria, for reading. Uh, I am glad that, you know, we, we got someone who can't pronounce, or who doesn't know how to pronounce all these Greek things. I am a Sotu man as well. It's very hard to say some of these uh, city names and, and people's names sometimes from the Bible. So I am glad. Uh, I think God is still honored in us uh, because it is still his word. So thank you for reading the text for me. Now, I want to pose the question um, to us this morning about what is culture. So the, the, the title of my sermon is when, when Culture Meets Christ. So in trying to understand um, what is culture, I want to ask a few questions. What do you think when you think of culture? What comes to mind for you? Do you think of things that your family do, like your customs and traditions? I know uh, a lot of the students would think of tax race culture. Tax as a good and vibrant race culture. Is that what you think of? I'm a sports fan, and uh, soccer or football is the one that I play and follow the most. Uh, I won't say which team I support because one, we, we suck right now, and two, our nickname is not very Christian, so I'll put that aside for now. Um, But when I think of sports teams and their fans, I always think of culture. Um, And there's this Netflix series that I really enjoy. It's called Sunderland Till I Die. Um, And basically it follows this football team in England in a town called Sunderland. And you see that the culture of the town, so this is a small town with a a football club that used to play play in the Premier League. Um, And this is a documentary series that just follows the club. But what you see is that the, the football culture is so ingrained in the culture of the town itself that on Sundays, the bishop of one of the churches, his robes are the colors of the football team. And he actually prays, he actually prays for the team in the service, which is super weird for me. <laughs> but you see how the culture of the football team, the, the culture that has engulfed the town, is a part of the church as well. And I don't know if you guys have ever met Arsenal fans as well. Sorry for making football references only. But if you ever talk to an Arsenal fan, they'll tell you that there's a conspiracy against them, that the refs have against them. Right? Any Arsenal fan will always tell you that. Um, but that, that is the culture that they have created and that they live out as fans of that club. We can talk about music as well. Um, which I'll mention later, uh, a bit later as well. But we, we have these, in music, people always talk about stands, right? Uh, there's a song by Eminem called Stan, and it's like this hectically big fan of Eminem, and he's writing him all these letters. Um, and, and I think that term is used for people who like basically worship certain artists, right? So when you think about culture, and I, I, I googled it because I was trying to understand what that term means. And the definition that I found and I liked that was applicable is that culture is the ideas, customs, and social behavior of a particular people or society. The ideas, customs, and social behavior of a particular people or societies. The ideas being the beliefs, the thoughts, like what you what's in your your head, and sometimes in your heart as well. The customs are the things you do, how you uh, go around, what what you decide to do in the morning. The the custom of that bishop in in Sunderland is to pray for his team. And the social behavior is how you interact with others around you or how you interact with the world. All of this forms our culture. And so everyone everywhere is a part of, or plays a part in, the culture of the area or the group of people that they are around. We all play a part, 
either actively or passively in how people around us think, what they do, and how they interact with each other. We, we are part of shaping the culture around us. So what happens when someone comes in and challenges those ideas, customs, and social behavior? I mentioned music stands. Uh, who, who in here uh, knows Beyonce? I'm sure everyone has heard of Beyonce. Who loves Beyonce? So the, there's, a, there's a term for people who love Beyonce. They're called the beehive. You say anything negative on social media about Beyonce, and you see the swarm of the bees come upon you. That's how you get canceled. And so, but in, in situations like that, how do we respond when someone comes into our culture or challenges something we hold on to dearly like that? We have a good example of that in the passage today. So let's dig into it. So just a, a short recap. Uh, Paul is in Macedonia. Um, it's one of the provinces in the Roman Empire. And this is a second missionary journey. We, we, we saw in, and uh, I heard that Reynard didn't preach last week, so you guys must have missed part of uh, chapter 16, but we see a series of accounts of individuals who heard the gospel and responded positively to it. So stories of individuals and not groups of people who heard the gospel and responded to it. We saw uh, there's Lydia, so this is in Philippi. Uh, there's Lydia first, um, and then they get beaten up and thrown, Paul and Silas get beaten up badly and thrown into jail because they exercised, exorcised the spirit out of a slave girl. And then in that jail that they get sent to, the jailer, their jailer is converted and supposedly his whole household follows suit. That's where, and then they, they, they get released after that, and then we come to chapter 17 where they come into Thessalonica. So um, we'll, we'll see in verses 1 to 9, um, the first point, if you're writing down points, is that the message of the gospel is culture confronting. The message of the gospel is culture confronting. So I'll go almost verse by verse just explaining, and then we'll, we'll hit application later on. So in verse 1, we read that Paul and Silas come into Thessalonica and they pass through Amphipolis and Apollonia. I'm a, I'm a Sutu man, like I said, these are foreign words for me. Uh, but he, he, comes, he goes through these, these cities on the way to Thessalonica um, and they're on this road that was known as the Via Ignatia from Philippi. So on his way from Philippi to Thessalonica, he passes through these, t these two towns. But Thessalonica was the most important out of these three. It was the capital city of the province of Macedonia, and it was a major harbor and trading center. Most, most importantly is that it was a Gentile city because Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. That's how he refers to himself over and over again in some of his epistles. Paul knew that he couldn't reach all Gentiles, and so what he did is he was specific in going to certain cities and, and praying and hoping that the work that the gospel does in those cities would then spread out to others, to the cities nearby, to the smaller cities. And so that's what he would do. And what he does when he gets into these cities is that he starts in the synagogue of the Jews. So even though he was an apostle to the Gentiles, he still starts in the synagogue of the Jews. What it tells us about the city, though, the fact that there was a synagogue, is that um, there must have been a sub substantial Jewish population or community here. Uh, and so even though the city in itself was a Gentile city, there was a Jewish influence of culture in it. The synagogue, if for those who don't know, was the Jewish house of worship. So... Uh, similar to how church is the house of worship for Christians, that's in, 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 in that century, the synagogue was the house of worship for Jews. And so he would go in. That's what he always did when he arrived. That was his modus operandi. He would go in, and it, it tells us in verse 2 that he spent 
three Sabbath days there, reasoning with him from the scriptures. Uh, that's about two weeks. We can say at least two weeks. Um, but we don't know if he's, how much more he stayed in the city or not. But he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He reasoned with the people in the synagogue from the scriptures. And this, this would be the Old Testament at the time because they didn't have the New Testament. Um, he would reason, explain, and prove. Oh, can I have the text up so people can follow better? He would, he would reason, explain, and prove for them. And why he would do this is because he wanted to show them that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. This was paramount. He used to use passages like Psalm 2. He was using the Old Testament. He used passages like Psalm 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 110, and Isaiah 53. All of these were pointing towards the fact that there's this Davidic king that was to come. And the Jews were waiting for this king. This Davidic king would come, the Messiah, the Christ. And he had to suffer. He had to die and he had to rise from the dead. It was not a maybe. It was not a perhaps. It needed to happen. And in general, the Messiah was seen in, in, in that context as a royal and powerful figure the fulfiller of the promise to David of a continuation of his kingdom with its regal splendor. And so the image of the suffering servant king was something that the Jews of that day had utterly forgotten or just did not understand. And it wasn't just all the Jews. The, the, the disciples who followed Jesus also didn't understand this. He kept telling them over and over again, I have to die. I have to suffer, I have to die, and I have to rise again. That's what needs to happen. And they still didn't get it. So what more about those who weren't with him? Those who just heard the stories, or those who hadn't heard of Jesus at all? This was something that was tough to preach. And if you add the resurrection to that as well, you can imagine what kind of situation Paul and Silas were being put into. And so it was very important for them to use the scriptures to prove and explain why that was necessary. He then, he then connects these prophecies of this Messiah, this king that was supposed to come. He connects it with the actual person of Jesus. The person of Jesus is the Christ that was awaited. That's all he was explaining. And how did he do this? He just told the story of Jesus. He told about his birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his exaltation, the gift of the Holy Spirit that followed, his present reign, and the fact that he will come again, he will return again, and that he offers salvation to all, but at the same time, he warns of judgment to those who don't accept his invitation. We just sang uh, the creed. It says we believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, that he's coming back again. That, that's, what was Paul, that's what Paul was preaching. That's what he was preaching. We're not singing anything different from what he would have sang at the time, what he would have preached at the time. Peter also preached this exact message in Acts 2 at Pentecost. And Jesus, this is the, the story that Jesus also commanded to his disciples in Luke 24. Go and tell them that the Messiah had to suffer and die and rise again. And so Paul opened up these scriptures of the Old Testament and showed them text after text, just as D Jesus did to those on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, 25 to 27. He showed them that the Messiah had to suffer and die which is something, like I said, that the Jews of the day had already forgotten. And he argued from the scriptures, using all the prophecies that he could find about the Messiah in the Old Testament. He knew these because he was an educate, educated Jew. He was a Pharisee. He knew the law back to front, off the top of his head. And he realized that the more people were aware of the word of God, the greater the response to the preaching. And so you couldn't just preach 
from wherever. He couldn't just make up stories. He had to use the text. Biblical preaching is what turned the world upside down. And Romans 10, 17 reminds us of that way when Paul tells the church in Rome that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. So he stirred the pot. He stirred the pot knowing that he would face great criticism for it, but he knew that this message that the Messiah had to suffer was one he had to preach. And the result of that was that there was division. In verses 4 and 5, we see that some were pers persuaded to join Paul and Silas. This preaching divided the hearers. There were those who embraced it and those who rejected it. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. Those who were saved, those who responded in faith, heard the message, accepted it, and it transformed their lives forever. All kinds of people were saved that day. Among these, it says, were the Jews, devout Greeks, and leading or well-known women of the city. And so the message was heard by all. It was heard by those who were supposed to hear it, those who were in the synagogue. But it was also heard by those who were devout Greeks, Gentiles, the people Paul had said he was an apostle to. They heard it as well, and as well as women. Now, I should have, I should have honestly prepared better in, in understanding the context of how women were viewed and seen at the time. But it's interesting that Luke, as he writes this, decided to put this down, and I think it's important because we need to see that the gospel is for everyone. It's for everyone from any background, any, any place, any social standing, all of them. Anyone can hear the gospel and respond to it. But we see on the other side that the Jews, some of the re religious Jewish leaders were jealous. And this has been what's been happening from Acts 5. So it's not a new thing. It didn't start uh, with Paul. It started with the other apostles with Peter and the other guys. And, and what these guys did is, these are the leaders, right? These are the people that, look up, that the Jews in, in the city would have looked up to, to let them know how to do this, to let them know how to go about life. These are the guys that rounded up bad men. Like they literally planned and went out and gathered all the bad men of the city and they formed a mob with them so that there may be an uprising against the teaching of the gospel. And this was not the first time as well that this had happened to Paul. This has been happening everywhere he went. And so the city was in an uproar and, and these guys, this mob attacked, attacked the house of Jason, whom we assume would have been one of the people that had heard the gospel and responded in faith to it. And so he decided to host these missionaries. He decided to host Paul and Silas. They attacked the house and they wanted to bring them out to the crowd. They wanted to hurt them. They wanted to get them beaten up. These guys, these religious leaders, didn't want to engage Paul on an intellectual level. They didn't want to sit down and open scriptures and argue against it. They chose violence. They woke up and they chose violence. And in verse 6, we see that by God's grace, they didn't find them. They couldn't find the missionaries. But, and so they just dragged Jason and some of the other brothers before the city officials. They got there and they said, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. These men that have been going around challenging culture, shaking things up, they are here also. And so, as they were doing that, they wanted everyone else to be against them. They wanted to cause the public dis... Oh, yeah, they wanted everyone to be against them. And so, the charges that they put up to the city authorities is that Paul and Silas were upsetting the people. That was the first charge he put, they put against them. They were upsetting the people. They caused an uproar. And the second one, which I think would have gotten them into more trouble is that they were acting against the decrees of Caesar. Now, Caesar was the emperor at the time, 
And so essentially what they were saying is these guys are trying to overthrow the government. And particularly because they were saying that Paul and Silas are saying there is another king, Jesus. And this is true. Jesus was charged with the same charge in Luke 23 when he stood in front of um, the authorities, in front of Pontius Pilate. They said that he has declared himself as the king. And it is right. If Jesus is our king, then there are things in our culture, things in our context, that we must be willing to bow down to. If Jesus is our king, we must be unwilling to bow down to these things in a way similar to how we should bow down to him. And so as all of this is happening, these guys pursued the city of authorities as well. And they were equally disrupted, and so they jumped into action. They then took money from Jason as security. And to show that this is really just against Paul and Silas, they let these guys go. There was no trial, there was no torture, there was no imprisonment. All they, did, all they wanted to do is guarantee that Paul and Silas would not come back. They wanted to guarantee that Jason would not host them again. So Paul and Silas had confronted a culture. They had confronted the ideas, customs, and social behavior of the people of Thessalonica. They had done this whether those people were Jews, Greeks, men, or women. The gospel was shared, and it confronted all they had known and were comfortable with, and it required a response. Some responded in faith, and others became Oh, some responded in faith and became brothers, while others rejected the message and chose violence and opposition to the message being preached. And for that, Paul and Silas were wanted men, and they were chased out of the city. So from this example in Thessalonica, we don't really see a good response to the confronting gospel message from the people as a whole. But we do, however, see it in Berea. So in verses 10 to 15, the second point is that this is a good response to the gospel message. So these brothers and sisters, those who had come to believe, they sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. So they didn't want to do it publicly. They sent them away by night. um, And Berea was about 90 kilometers away from Thessalonica. And upon arrival into uh, Berea, Paul and Silas did the same thing they've always done. They went into the synagogue. They opened the scriptures. But it says, the difference here is that it says the Jews here were more noble. They received the word with all eagerness. They were not contentious, but they were willing to hear what they had to say. And as they heard it, they didn't just hear it and believe it, but they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So they received received the the gospel message with all eagerness. They examined the scriptures and they did this daily. They realized that that Oh, what, what this brings out, what Luke was highlighting, um, is that by, say, by using the word daily, is that these guys in Berea were not casual students of Paul's preaching and of the scriptures. They knew that God's word is not just Sunday course. They knew that God's word is not just seven colors. It's not a once a week thing. And so they waited up frequently. They sat under the teaching and probably listened to him on a daily basis. These guys were the ideal audience. And they wanted to follow the evidence wherever it may lead. They must have believed that scripture was God's written word and therefore must be seen as supreme and the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And so they received it 
But as, as they received it, they paired it with critical questioning. They didn't just receive it blindly. They recognized they wanted scripture to be their final authority and to validate the claims of the apostle. And a result of this, again, this is, this is interesting to see because you see that whether there's opposition or not, whether people are eager to receive the message or not, the Holy Spirit works regardless. And so in Thessalonica, people came to faith, and even now in Berea, many of them believed and were saved. In Berea, this was as a result of the right attitude towards Scripture and the Gospel message. And the difference at this point, before the, the other Jews get there, is that the ones who didn't believe were peaceful, at least at this point. They hadn't caught a, an, up, an uproar yet. It took the same crew that Paul and Silas had left behind to come in and cause an uproar again. And so these Jews from Thessalonica then come in verse 13, when they heard what's been happening, they came and they started again agitating and stirring up the crowds. And so new believers again realized this and then they split uh, Paul and Silas up because they realized that, no, they, they, they split everyone up because they realized that Paul is the focus of the anger. These, these Jews are not mad at people that are becoming Christians. Yes, the persecution would come, but they were particularly mad at these guys that were sharing the gospel message. And so they sent Paul off on his way to the sea. Timothy and Silas remi- remained behind in Berea, and they continued sharing the gospel. And those that accompanied, so a few of those believers then accompanied Paul all the way to Athens. And then once they received a command, for Silas and Timothy to come, they left him there. And that's where we get to the end of the passage. So I, I personally love the response of the people in the city. I love their culture. And I wish that all believers and churches would seek to replicate it. And so moving towards some application points, we can see that when culture meets Christ, two things happen. It's either there's faith or opposition. The gospel, in as much as it is unifying, also divides. The sheep are separated from the goats. And so when the gospel is shared, there's going to be either faith or there's going to be opposition. God saves through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works in us as we hear the word being preached. Romans 10, 17, uh, that I quoted earlier, it says, For faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So when scripture is heard preached, it provokes a response. And when the Holy Spirit comes alongside that, faith comes. A few verses before that, in Romans 10, 13, Paul says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not everyone who's a good person. Everyone. We have to realize that in Genesis 3, uh, in in the garden, after creation, everything was perfect. We were united with God. What happened in in chapter 3 of Genesis is that there was the fall. Sin came into the world, and it created a divide between God and man. Man, it left a space in our hearts that we've been trying to fill up with other things and that, did it, that wasn't just for the people in that time. It's still for us today. There are always things we want to latch on to. Pinky mentioned a few of them earlier. We always want to fill this God-shaped space, hole in our hearts. And we try to fill it up with many other things. The only thing that, can fill it up, that we should fill it up with, the only thing that can fully satisfy is the, is the gospel. It's God himself. And we don't have to do anything with that. It's a free gift that God gives to us. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. Jesus, the one who had to suffer and die, has already suffered on your behalf. If you believe in his finished work, If you call on his name, then you will be saved. You don't need to be perfect. You don't need to clean yourself up before that. You're not bringing anything to the table. 
He has done it all. He has died for your sins. He has died for your guilt. He has done, died for your shame. It is finished. And so we should call on him. We should respond to hearing the gospel preached in faith. The other response is opposition. There are those who oppose Jesus and his message. And as much as we believers recognize the gospel to be the power of God, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18 that it is a folly to those who are perishing. To those who don't believe, it doesn't make sense. They will ridicule the word and they will ridicule us. They will oppose us and they will oppose the word. And a lot of the times they don't just passively oppose, but we know that in our day and age they will actively do it. There was no shortage of them in the time of Acts 17, and we should not expect that there will be a shortage of those who oppose, oppose the gospel message today in our day and age. And so what do we do? What should we do? If you're sitting here today or listening online, you are fortunate to be in a church that preaches the culture-confronting message of the gospel. There are churches out there that don't have solid preaching, and that severely impacts how the members engage with the world around them. So the first challenge I want to bring to us in application is that you may pray for more and more churches and pastors that preach God's word faithfully and truth, truthfully. We want to proclaim the king. We want to proclaim Jesus. Not being afraid of how they would be perceived or how we would be perceived or if these pastors should get cancelled, but that they would engage the world, the world well with God's word. Encouraging the good things, because there are good things about our culture. Encouraging the good things and condemning the bad. And not deciding for themselves what is good or bad, but allowing scripture to dictate that for them. But not just for them, not just for the pastors, but that we may all, as individuals in the church, also be witnesses. That we may individually confront aspects of our culture that are contrary to what God's word, um, to what God, God's word says, and that we share the gospel of hope as we do so. Trusting in the work that God can do through the Holy Spirit in other people's hearts the same way he has done in ours. And I love how the book of Acts shows us this. It's a collection of stories that showcase how the Holy Spirit worked miraculously through normal people to shake up the world. That same Holy Spirit that Paul and Peter and all the other apostles got, that same Holy Spirit dwells in us as believers today. God can use us as well to share his word. And so for ourselves, may we pray for boldness to do so as we challenge aspects of our culture. And may we also pray for the salvation of those who don't yet believe. And as this gospel is being preached faithfully, I plead that those who have not responded in faith to the gospel consider it right now. Consider it today. There is an invitation. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that what Christ brings, his message, is a way back to our maker. It mends that broken relationship from Genesis 3. I pray that those who haven't responded may be challenged to find our fulfillment in him. And what about for those who have? I pray that we may allow the gospel of Jesus to challenge how we live as his witnesses. May we search the scriptures diligently as the Bereans did and see from them how we are called to live. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. That's Psalm 119 verse 9. When culture seeks to tell us who we are, what we should do, and how we should act, we need to turn to the scriptures and examine if we indeed should do so. 
and see if we should live the way the culture is trying to tell us to live. This, the Bible, is God's word. And 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 tells us that it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Everything we need to know about how we are to live our lives as Christians is in the book. Everything we need to know about how to glorify God with our lives is here. And so may we therefore be Bereans in that regard. And to close off, I'll touch, off, I'll touch on an, a sensitive aspect of our culture as an example of something that can be challenged as we diligently search the scriptures. I'm a, a black man in South Africa, and because of our history with regards to race, I am expected to think, respond to, and relate to white people a certain way, right? I'm sure it's a sensitive issue, but it's, it's the reality of where we are as a country. And yet when I heard the gospel, I had to co- reconsider all of that. When Paul preached, the Jews, Greeks, men and women came to faith. These were people from different backgrounds, people who in the past would have hurt each other, people who would have done grievous things to each other. But after they come to faith, in the text, in in Acts 17, we see that they now refer to as brothers and sisters because that's the reality of it. That's, That's what Jesus does in our hearts and in our lives as a community. When people are saved, we come together united under his body. And so when black people, white people, Indians, coloreds, and other people from all other contexts become Christians, it's no different. Christ died to unify his body. That is a beautiful thing. We have to celebrate it. And I pray that we may live in light of that truth and many other truths. It's a hard one, I know that. But when we hear the message of the gospel, we need to be challenged. We need to, to think about how culture is trying to have us live. And we need to respond with it by searching the scriptures. So what do you do when today's culture tells you something? Anything. What do you do when the loudest voices echo throughout society? When they, tell, when they want to tell you about morality, what is right and what is wrong. When they want to tell you about sexuality. When they want to tell you about idolatry. Cultural things. I'm sure as black people we, we realize these. I come from a family that still practices ancestral worship. What do I do as a Christian? What do we do when our culture is trying to say something about racism? around us? What do you do when someone in your family is racist? What do you do when we see our society be more and more xenophobic? I pray that for Red Door Church and other churches in South Africa, that we may lead the way in seeing and listening to what the scriptures say daily. That we may be a community that recognizes scripture as our final authority that we may be a community that studies this book. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for the the culture-confronting message of the gospel. Um, we, We live the lives that we live right now because we are sinful the way in which culture that we form ourselves uh, will lead us is further and further away from you. And so we thank you for churches that preach the gospel, that preach the true gospel, that we hear them and that we can respond positively in faith, realizing that there is nothing in and out of ourselves that we bring to the table, but that Jesus, you did it all on the cross for us. And so I pray, Heavenly Father, that we may be a church and a community of believers that seeks to, re- to share this gospel message of reconciliation
to our maker with everyone that we know. And as we do that, as we engage what is normal in our, our fallen world, I pray that we may continually search the scriptures and that we may use them to help people come to a saving knowledge of you. May you work greatly through your Holy Spirit. We, 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 we pray in thankfulness knowing that this Holy Spirit that, was, was, that encouraged and emboldened the apostles to take the gospel to all nations, with us particularly in the room being part of the all nations, being part of the ends of the world, being Gentiles. We thank you, Heavenly Father, and we pray that many more people may continually hear this message and many more people may be reconciled to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.